Welcome back, guys. Well, I have a special treat for you today. It's part one of my interview with Justin Barber, the NL Explorer. He's a proud Newfoundlander and explores some of the most remote areas of our country. Today, he's going to tell us all about his trip, his 83-day solo trip with his dog, Saku, across 1,000 kilometers of the most remote wilderness in Labrador and Quebec. He has an impressive exploring resume, including traveling 700 kilometers for 68 days west to east across Newfoundland, 120 kilometers down the Avalon Peninsula in Newfoundland, 50 kilometer adventure uh, in, down the Sandhill River in Labrador, and countless other adventures off the beaten path. Stay tuned, this is part one. Next week there'll be part two, so don't forget to hit the subscribe and notification bell so that you don't miss the videos in this series. All right, let's get into it. Here I sat down with Justin Barber. Welcome, Justin. Thanks so much for being with me today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So yeah, you're just freshly back from um, your latest adventure. Uh, what made you want to start adventuring again? And tell us about where you traveled. Yes, that's a complex question. Uh, <laughs> you know, why I wanted to start doing what I, you know, do to this extent. Uh, you know, I always kind of grew up enjoying the outdoors. It was my childhood. So in the simplest way here, I just I got away from it. I played a lot of competitive hockey throughout my life, and that took up you know tra between training and being on the ice, it took up a lot of my time, and you know I loved it. Uh, but I returned home from playing some uh, some junior hockey in New Brunswick, uh, in Miramichi actually, mm -hmm. and uh, I did a physical education degree at Mon. Uh, there was an outdoor education course. We did a canoeing trip with our class. It was a two night canoeing trip, and I say from there uh, it kind of. You know, I would kindle that love for the outdoors and the hook was in. And from there, I got into like watching documentaries and reading books on people doing crazy expeditions and I wanted to try my own. So uh, I worked my way up from one night to two to seven to 68 to 83, which was this year's trip uh, across the Labrador Peninsula or a portion of it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So. What made you choose Labrador uh, for this adventure? Well, uh, you know, uh, as you said during the introduction, uh, with, with Saku there, we did a uh, 68-day trip across Newfoundland last year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of good content and, you know, you know I've been sharing some stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I like getting out our province, you know, and showing off all the backcountry and wilderness we have here. So I figured if I had done one part of the province, you know, I might as well try to tackle the rest, you know. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was I actually taught, I'm a teacher, a uh, K-12 phys ed and science teacher, so okay. yeah. uh, I taught for a lab in Cartwright in Labrador. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the year before my Newfoundland trip. And uh, so I had a taste of, that was my first time in the big land, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a taste of it. So uh, for my second big expedition, you know, I got back from my Newfoundland one, I really wanted to get out there and do something else. So uh, 10 months later, I chose Labrador. You must have had to go through some meticulous planning to tell us about how you chose the route that you were going to take. Uh, yeah, that was a bit of a process. That's a good question because I haven't really been asked that one before. It was a long trip. My, my plan was to leave from Northwest River, mm -hmm. uh, which was on the, the eastern coast of Labrador, and go 1,000 kilometers across that, or uh, sorry, 1,700 kilometers yeah. across there to Hudson Bay, to Quarajipik, which was a, a small reserve there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of wanted to leave from Labrador, but I've, you know, one of the big challenges leaving from the coast of Labrador is climbing to the height of land, which you basically climb uh, around 2,000 uh, feet in less than like 100 and 80 kilometers so it's a wow. quick climb to, to the height of land because mm -hmm. you know interior Labrador is like a big plateau yep. and everything runs to the sea so then I had thought about starting you know on the the Hudson Bay way and making my way up the Great Whale River which is the river that I was supposed to finish my trip on mm -hmm. uh, but you know I was, that was a big it's a really big river it's like 700 kilometers long roughly high water flows and I didn't really want to drag my canoe up that one so I decided uh, to start on the east coast and uh, this was a trip by canoe so I was using the waterways as much as I could mm -hmm. and yeah I had it was a lot of paddling so it was kind of up uh, the Red Wine River which was the first river on the, on the coast of Labrador and then that would take me to a uh, Smallwood Reservoir and from there I climbed another river the McFadden to get to Canyon Pisco Reservoir and uh, Winter came and the lakes froze up, a lot 
quicker than I anticipated. I mean, I knew I knew winter came a lot quicker up in the north mm -hmm. from my experience living in Labrador, but uh, it came on like a month earlier than than normal and one of the earliest winters in around 25 years, according to the locals. So I had to end my trip early at the thousand kilometer mark. So I had 1,700 or 700 left, mm -hmm. but uh, it just wasn't possible. So you were saying that you were in an area. Um, that you hadn't seen a lot of signs of other humans sort of traveling along your road. Is that true? Like to get help or anything? You were kind of on your own, right? Yeah, it was uh, over these 83 days. I I had spent around 24 hours with in, in an area of civilization. And that's, well, I had people drive in on a remote woods road uh, to drop me off supplies. Uh, that was my first resupply. Okay. Uh, and then I came up, up on the, it's a Menahek, it's a hydro structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some workers there. And then I had a, a second resupply. So, uh, you know, throughout three, three of those things, over the 83 days, I had around 24 hours of human contact, I guess. And even with these people coming in, I mean, the second time I had a resupply, someone had to fly in. It was the only way they can get to me, right? right and right. when they drove in on the dirt road for the first week supply, it was like 180 kilometers from the closest community, which was Churchill Falls. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I was I was definitely rem you know extremely remote and uh, you know far from any immediate help, and that's why I had to carry like satellite phones and like uh, a Garmin InReach with mm -hmm. an SOS device for like emergencies and stuff like that. Uh, but you know that's part of the appeal to me is you know I, I like going for a weekend hike uh, close to a community or close to town I enjoy that too yeah. don't get me wrong but to get out in the remote areas and places where you know very few people go if any ever uh, you know that's what I enjoy so that's what, why these trips take me far off the beaten path yeah, and I enjoyed following you on your Facebook and I'll explore you put um, you would let little pings out from your in reach and so we could see where you yeah. were and I was sort of following along and it was incredible. Like just all the I mean, it just looked like the middle of nowhere with all the ponds and lakes and stuff and where you were camped down and stuff. It was very fascinating to follow you on that trip. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of selfish to go out on a trip like this uh, in this day and age and not have devices like that to let people know, uh, you know, where you're to and how you're doing, whether it's my parents or my girlfriend or uh, like people who have followed me on my Facebook page, for example, who mm -hmm. who knew I was going to do this. And if there's a couple times where I had issues with my device and I missed a night and uh, Heather would tell me that people, there was people writing that uh, they were, they were somewhat worried about, you know, about my, our status. Right. So yeah. uh, it was important to have those devices, but uh, yeah, I know it's definitely some cool, some cool places along the way and Labrador is, uh, is, is extremely unique and uh, you know probably one of the last untouched uh, you know places on the planet uh, you know in certain areas anyways very rugged and wild and uh, great experience how was the weather on your trip when you were out there the weather was uh, it was windy a lot of wind. <laughs> I've reading about that. <laughs> you know, whoever was following my post would, would understand that I battled a lot of wind, and uh, I knew that. I mean, I kind of knew that going into this trip, but spending my year in Cartwright, I knew in the fall in Labrador with those prevailing westerlies, uh, you know, winds can get bad and they can be consistent and they can last for days and days. Then you, you, you add in Smallwood, the reservoir, and Canny Pisco, which are re two real big systems, which kind of create their own winds and their own weather. Okay. Uh, so, uh, like early on when I was climbing up this Red Wine River, uh, you know, a couple hundred kilometers to the height of land, wind wasn't an issue because, you know, on the river, I was just dragging my canoe and lining it mostly, very seldom did I paddle. Okay. So wind was no issue. I mean, I, I, I dealt with some rain and stuff then, but that was no big deal. Mm -hmm. But once I got on the big lakes, uh, wind started to eat me up. And uh, that's what ultimately also kind of delayed my progress. And, uh, you know, when winter came on, uh, if I was a little further in my route, uh, I could have took this river, the Great Whale River, to the ocean and uh, it wouldn't have been froze over. But all the wind had me, I, I took 30 days off because of wind. 
Oh, wow. That, yeah. So, uh, out of the, uh, you know, the last, it was 83 days, but the last three days of my trip, I was waiting for a chopper to come get me. So, yeah. technically, my, my trip lasted 80 days. Yeah. And the 30 of those, or 29, were off from wind. Right. So, the other 50 were travel days. Okay. Uh, but other than the wind, I mean, like, uh, it got cold in the last three weeks. Uh, in the last 21 days, temperatures went above zero twice. <laughs> so they, they were around, around every, you know, the average temperature in those three weeks was like minus three, minus four, which was also well below the seasonal normals for there because I had checked weather charts before I left. Yeah. And, uh, and then snow came on, like snow squalls and stuff like that again in the last few weeks uh, when winter decided it wanted to really come on and stick around mm -hmm. although it was only early October like October 1st and 2nd uh, yeah. they have a lot of these weird snow squalls in Labrador where and like northern Quebec and, and these parts of the world that I hadn't experienced before were basically uh, throughout a day I could get a half a dozen snowstorms or snow squalls I was calling them it was it'd be like sunny for 10 or 15 minutes yeah. and then the wind would just pick up out of nowhere and, and uh, there'd be white caps and there'd be like white out snow squalls where I had to pull the, my canoe off the lake lakes uh, sometimes when those got bad so I mean some days that was two or three times me having to pull in and wait for 15 20 minutes wow what a challenge and, but then it'd be sunny again for 10 or 15 minutes yeah. like, out of nowhere which that kind of hurt my solar charging too because uh, uh, you know that I wasn't getting enough juice so devices started to die on me and that's a whole other story too let's talk about gear for a second so how like what did you bring like some of the highlights of what you brought so uh you know i guess you know everything was important nothing no, nothing really meant more to me than the next thing probably my fishing rod and my canoe you know and mm -hmm. but like i had uh i had the canoe of course that was an s uh, as you know, a nice light canoe made with their new T Formex uh, material, which is like high durability, but also extremely light. Uh, you know, I had like two two bags, I guess. Well, one, one was a food barrel. I'm sure you've seen those before. Yep, yep got one. And I had a, a, a pack harness on that, so that was to keep my food dry. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, also if beers were to come around, they'd have a lot harder time getting into my food barrel than they would my pack. Right. Because typically I didn't hang food. That's another topic, I guess, too. But I didn't really hang food because it's just a lot of effort and energy. And, uh, but yeah, so when I had uh, and then my other pack, which was a 110 liter pack, that carried all my kit, you know, my in my tent and my clothing and first aid for me and my and, and my dog Saku and and whatnot. And you know, and then like I had a 12 gauge shotgun for protection and you know to hunt later on I did some hunting for ducks and geese later on when the seasons opened yep. um, you know Saku had you know his own kibble and he had a bag to carry that stuff which he actually didn't end up using that often because he spent more time in the canoe than I expected oh, okay and when we were going up the rivers I wouldn't put the pack on him I just felt it was too hard and I just leave it in the canoe so uh, stuff like that and then of course I had like uh, like I had a two-person tent, an MSR tent, mm -hmm. lightweight, uh, only weighs like two pounds, but you know can stand up to a lot of storms and and whatnot. Uh, I've, I've put it through the paces over the last couple of years. It was actually the same tent I used my Newfoundland trip, so okay. it's, done right. me, it's done me well. It's, it's, it has hundreds of nights spent in it. Is uh, that the one you took out in the winter that time as well? Yeah, I started in the winter for yeah. that one. Well, I started in the spring. That was also a weird weather event. There was snow right up until like early May, and that's kind of unusual for Newfoundland. Yeah. Like I had my fishing rod and all my tackle. I mean, uh, stuff like that. I, I don't re like rely completely on the land to survive. I'm not, you know, on a trip where you're covering a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to do that. It's something I'd like to try though. Maybe go out and pitch it up in one spot or one, you know, tight area for and see how long I can kind of last. That's something that interests me yeah, as well. That's cool. But where these trips are so long, you, you, it's it's difficult to cover ground every day and be relying on things like fish, you know, which doesn't really give you as much energy as like, you know, carbs and, and other meats. But uh, I had my rod and, uh, you know, that definitely was a big supplement to my income. Uh, I ate it whenever I caught it, whenever I could get it. I caught a lot of, you know, I caught brook trout, a lot of lake trout, a lot of lake trout uh, in the reservoirs. Uh, so I got one pike, my first ever pike ever caught, because oh, wow. here in Newfoundland. So, uh, yeah, I hooked a, a northern pike. He was probably five pounds. But nice. uh, I had a late trout that was around seven or eight. 
So it was big size, and and I had some that that broke my line off. Wow. Uh, right, just I tried to bully him in, I guess. Right, <laughs> yeah. uh, just impatient and not used to having real big fish like that on my line all the time. But uh, for sure. You know, and then it's like, you know, I had my PFD, you know, my life jacket was important with the canoe, but, you know, uh, that had a lot of pockets and stuff in it, so it would have a pocket for my, like, my in-reach device to be always on my body if I were to capsize or something. Yeah. But it also, I'd always have, like, a survival kit in my life jacket done up with, like, uh, you know, some extra tackle and some, a flint and emergency blanket and a whistle mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, matches and stuff like that, some fire starter, maybe a granola bar, uh small knife just in case I capsized and lost everything. Right. Uh, you know, and other than that, just, you know, standard things. Anything that that you'd think I'd have with me, I don't know, like uh, that you'd want to ask about. Yeah, did you bring that um, that water turbine? I've been seeing that you posted about that where it generates power for you if you throw it in the water. That's very interesting. Well, that, I had some issues. So we can get into a lot of long stories here now. Yeah. Uh, I had used the water lily before I left. Water lily, that's right. And uh, I've tested it. And uh, yeah, that, that's the thing they put out on the market now. It's only been a year, but they're doing well with it. And it's a very effective device. Uh, it charges your your, uh, your your devices by wind or water rather than, uh, than solar, right? So it gives you an option if you're in a place like Labrador where sun is scarce sometimes. You always have water, you know what I mean? If you, if you have a river or a brook nearby, uh, that's their main use. Uh, wind charges it a little bit, but it's all about the water. Uh, anyway, so, you know, the device is, uh, I had a solar charger because I've, I had tested that for years and, you know, that's what I relied upon, but I was going to bring my Lily to test out for them in the second half of my expedition. Mm -hmm. It was the first half I was climbing up river. I had four or five kilometer portages. I was trying to go as light as possible, Mm -hmm. like every ounce counted. I was cutting trails to portage four kilometers because there was nothing there. It was completely untouched, like I said earlier. So I had to minimize my pack. But, uh, so when my second resupply came in, uh, Halfway through the trip, uh, the the pilot forgot some essential gear, and oh, I guess we should leave it at that. Which was, yeah, it was a bit of an issue, and uh, but I still had it and uh, had enough to get by and what I needed. And uh, my Lily didn't make it in, so I didn't get to use it after. But uh, they had supported me, and uh, you know they had gave me some help with some gear and stuff. And I will continue to support the Lily, and it's a great device. But I didn't get to test it uh, on the trip, so. Oh, but you had another solar charger you were mentioning that you may have. Yeah, had I, had a, I had a three-panel solar charger, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, that was uh, goal zero. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that it was great. I mean, I had, there was lots of sun early on in the trip. I mean, there was days where it was like plus 30 degrees, like, you know, 30, 31, 32. Like, I was, felt like I was in a, yeah. a tropical island, not in Labrador, you know what I mean? No, for sure. But that's Labrador, too. Like, it's it's 30 degrees, uh, you know, in the daytime, but then nighttime, you can get frost, right? Okay. Uh, it's, temperatures fluctuate where you're, you know, you're up a lot further north. But, uh, but yeah, no, that was, so, solar, the solar charger was important, right? For but, sure. uh did anything and any gear disappoint you or fail you when you needed it most? Do you, or is it something you didn't like? I have a power bank, of course, so I have a solar charger. I might as well stick to the electronics topic. Yeah. Because other than that, everything else is pretty solid. Everything I needed, you know what I mean? There was nothing there that was that I didn't need, you know? Yeah. But uh, I had a power bank, which was also goal zero. And uh, of course, during the daytime, uh, the solar panel only works like if I was to charge my inReach, it has to be connected to the solar panel. Some solar panels collect charge and they hold it, yep. but but they're usually not the best models from my experience. The better models feed off a power bank, so the sun takes in the, the, the charge, or the solar panel takes in the charge from the sun, and that's connected to your power bank. So I had a goal zero power bank, and uh, you know, my my issue with these things now, and I mean, I don't think you need to be going for 83 days, but people who use them are generally outside and they're generally battling with the elements. Yeah. So I'm confused on why any anyone, well, uh, maybe there is, I haven't stumbled across one yet, maybe you have. Uh, I don't know why they haven't came up with a waterproof model, yet, a waterproof power bank. Yeah. Because mine got wet, uh, I was basically doing a portage and I laid my solar panel on my power bank on my 
food barrel on top of it, collecting sun as I was portaging. I had like a two kilometer track back, so that was like 15 minutes where it could be there in the sun getting charged. Yeah. And uh, when I got back, the, the barrel tipped over and it was into the just some side water from the river, not the main river, but just some wet moss and stuff. Yeah. And it got damp and it was it was broken. I had to get a new one sent up to me. So it was kind of, it was a big issue there for a bit. Luckily, my resupply was only like uh, two weeks away and I got them to line me up another one. So that was, it was a little, you know, I think they should be waterproof. You know, if you're going out and doing any, it doesn't matter. You can go for like a week, right? Uh, or three or four day trip. Which generally, if you got that fully charged, it lasts for five or six days anyways, but. Yeah. Yeah. They should come up with something. It's a way to waterproof it or a case that, you know, it yeah. can be in and then be more acceptable. Because the, the, so, the solar panels, the panels are what, we, uh, weather resistant themselves oh, for sure. and could be submerged. But, uh, you know, when you try to charge a power bank in the daytime, uh, you know, uh, Things could get wet. Doesn't you know? Sun could come and then sun goes away and it could rain and you're moving and you don't put your power bank away. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just me being tired and not being able to organize things as I went. And that's that was part of the battle too. Uh, you know, yeah. when I'm out there and I'm exhausted and I'm just trying to make ground and move forward. Sometimes all the material items take a backseat. <laughs> oh, for sure. You were talking about food and rationing your food. Like, how many calories did you have to eat per day to kind of keep yourself in good shape? Uh, I had 3,200 calories per day with me, and that's a, and that's another aspect of these trips I'm still kind of wrestling with too, mm -hmm. uh, because I lose a lot of weight. I lost a lot of weight on my Newfoundland trip. I lost 20 pounds. This year I lost 26 pounds. So it's a lot of weight to lose in, in 80 days. Uh, you know, I come back weighing as much as I, do, I did in high school. Okay. And, uh, it's just interesting, but I mean that's a part of these trips. They're they're very demanding and. Uh, you're never going to be able to eat to replenish the calories that you burned on a day-to-day -day basis. Never. You've got to expect to lose a bit. Yeah. Well, I had a lot of like a lot of oils this year with me. Like I, I've, I consumed around three and a half liters of olive oil. Okay. Wow. In two and a half months, so I put like two tablespoons of olive oil, or maybe two tablespoons of olive oil in my in my oatmeal in the morning. I do the same thing at supper time, right? Yeah, it's a good tip. And uh, you know, I have. I had a lot. I dehydrated a lot of my own meals, uh, pastas and and goulashes and stuff. And I also had a lot of those freezer freeze dried ones that you can get from like Mech, you know. Yeah. Because dehydrating meals for eighty days would take a lot of time, right? Oh, God. So I did as much as I could because they're a little cleaner and healthier than the ones you buy. But uh, yeah, so yeah, I just try to get you know thirty two hundred calories a day, and that's what I had. Uh, that was a little. My trip last year, I had it at 2,800 to 2,900 because, you know, it's all about what you carry on your back. And, you know, this trip was a more in the canoe at times, so I could carry some extra, some more food uh, than I would normally carry if I was hiking because mm -hmm. the Newfoundland trip was much more walking involved. Sure. But there was still some big portages this year, and I didn't want to be carrying, like, you know, 100 pounds of food every time. So I try to go by as, as little as possible. And... Mm -hmm. I think I've only done my body good because of that. Uh, you know, I feel like I can run on less food now. And if I ever got myself into a situation, I think I can go like three or four days without food. Right. Water is important, right? So. Yeah, right. I just I've done. I've ex I've exerted my body on very very little, and uh, yeah. So, but that's a that's a battle I'm trying to figure out what food I'm taking and what are the most calorie dense foods, mm -hmm. right? You want to take things that you know have of course have a lot of fat because. Fat has the most calories per gram. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting into my biology background. But, uh, you know, it, it's important to manage that stuff. And I do punch a lot of numbers with the nutrition before I leave uh, as much as I can. But, yeah, a lot of chocolates and stuff like that too, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. I, take Cliff, I have two Cliff Bars a day. You know Cliff Bars? Yeah. yeah. They have like 250 to 280 calories per bar. So I always have two of those. And uh, then it's just my breakfast and my and my supper and a snack after supper, right? Which is generally not much. No, for sure. You think you're looking at the food bag, wanting to go back in there, but yeah. you can't, <laughs> no. right? And that's that's part of the sacrifice you make to get out there and have these experiences in, in remote areas. Yeah. Tell me a bit about Saku. I mean, he's a unique breed of dog. He's a Cape Shore water dog. Tell me a bit about him, how he did. Um, you know, he's a special kind of dog. I'd never heard of that breed of dog before. Yeah, it's, it's a breed from here in the province. Uh, 
but basically it's, it's a mixture of now anyways of uh, Labrador Retriever and Chesapeake Retriever mostly. Yeah. There could be some other t- types of Retriever mixed in there, some Portuguese Water Dog, I think. Okay. Um, but the Cape Shore Water Dog was a breed back in like the early 1900s and stuff that was like a hardy outdoors breed that hunters and trappers would use in the country and they'd use on the ocean retrieving sea ducks in January and February in, in very frigid Atlantic ocean temperatures. Yeah. Um, so he, does, he, still, he still does have the Cape Shore in him, but he's mixed with, uh, with the retriever in Chesapeake. That's why he kind of looks like a lab, but he has curly hair like a retriever, like he has curly fur, if you've noticed that in any pictures or videos. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like they're sold as a Cape Shore water dog, which is like, a lot of people are like, geez, it's a lab. I said, no, well, it's not. Because if you go down to, to Branch, the community in Newfoundland where I got that and called him a, where I got Saku and call him a, a Labrador Retriever, yeah. they don't like that. Sorry, my phone. That's okay. uh, they, don't, they don't appreciate that. It's Cape Shore water dog and that's what they want it to be called. But yeah, uh, yeah he's, he's two years old now. And I mean, he's got a lot of going under his belt too. We done the Newfoundland trip and he done this trip uh, we done this year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he's living the best life of any active dog out there, right? No doubt and, about it, yeah. So, you know, he's cut out for it, and, uh, hey, that's, I, I, you know, when I started getting into this stuff, and I started going for longer than one or two nights, uh, you know, I had difficulty finding people who wanted to go, and, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to make the commitments. Uh, people have families. People have work. Not everyone is a teacher who has summers off and right now I'm substituting. So it's even more flexible where I can take even weeks off throughout the year, you know, if it's, you know, feasible enough. So, uh, so, you know, and the, but, you know, bottom line, it was hard to find, uh, you know, people to go. So that's why I got Saku, you know, I always wanted a dog growing up and, uh, you know, just between hockey and all this and all the responsibilities, my parents weren't really, really willing to look after a dog for me, so that didn't happen. Right. <laughs> uh, so when I got out and, uh, you know, on my own, and then I met Heather, and, and she, in our, we were together for a couple of years, and she went and got a husky. I, I'm sure you, I don't know if you see beer in any yeah, of my yeah. pictures. Yep. And the videos too. So she had a husky, and uh, yeah, uh, when I wanted to do these trips, I kind of was like, well, can I take beer on my Newfoundland trip, you know, for 68 days. And uh, I kind of understood she wanted to have a companion at home too. And uh, that probably wasn't going to work out. So I looked around and found Saku and uh, couldn't have picked a better person to, to take or a, a companion to take along with me. He's not a person, but I treat him like one sometimes. Oh yeah, you feed him well too. <laughs> right. And you know, yeah, he, uh, yeah. So yeah, he had a, he had a sponsorship from a Nookshook uh, professional dog food and, uh, it's actually called Cory Dog Food, but a Nook Shook is a branch. Uh, they're a company based out of Fredericton, so they supported Saku with professional uh, sporting dog food that's used by like hunting dogs and and sled dogs and stuff. So very high protein, high fat food. So uh, yeah, I had him on that, and he was looked after there. And uh, yeah, just great to have him out there. Right, dogs are. You know, you feed off, they're, you know, they're entertaining and he's fun to have around and, you know, you got a little cuddle buddy and uh, uh, his energy is contagious. Like, you know, you know, he's always 20 or 30 yards ahead of me when we're not in the canoe if we're on land walking or portaging and stuff. And I'm like, if he can keep going, I can keep going, you know? Yeah, great motivation and someone to talk to at night, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, that thing there. And, uh, you know, dogs don't complain either. So generally, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> which a lot of times... Uh, I just, you know, I don't want to rub anyone the wrong way, but the way society is going, uh, you know, I don't know if, if, not everyone, but I don't know if all of us are hardy as we once once were, or True. humans weren't, weren't, uh, once were. So, uh, you know, not everyone wants to be out there doing this kind of stuff and going through that, but a dog, uh, especially a dog like Saku, who's tough as nails, and they, mm-hmm. can, they can go on and go through the rain or go through the bush or through the flies or through the bogs or whatever it might be and generally if I you know keep a close eye on him and make sure he's looked after there's no issues. And so concludes part one of this interview. It's been fascinating hearing all about Justin and Saku's adventures. The adventures continue next week next Sunday. I will be posting part two of this interview where we learn uh, all about some memorable experiences on the trip, a scary moment on the trip, how he's coping with returning to city life after 83 days with minimal human contact. 
and also some advice for some would-be explorers. Stay tuned, you don't want to miss the next interview. Don't forget, hit the subscribe button and the little notification bell. I hope you guys have a great week. Take care.